Tet Education Manager for South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, and I'm the, I'm the bird fanatic uh, with us. Um, my love for birds started about nine years ago uh, when I saw a Baltimore Oriole uh, fly in front of me whenever we were living in Pittsburgh. Uh, before that, uh, you know, I'm a hunter and fisherman. I played a lot of sports growing up um, and, you know, love the outdoors and love the, the bigger, the larger animals. Always loved my ducks um, and, and owls, but I never really paid attention to the birds that I love uh, now, the, the small songbirds. Um, but uh, you know, that Oriole changed my life and now I'm teaching about uh, Orioles and, and other birds. And I'm just uh, um, appreciative that y'all are, are with us today. So, you know, ask those questions in the chat box again, and then Shannon will uh, kind of sift through those um, and then interrupt me from time to time. And if we don't get to one, hopefully we'll, we'll see it um, and uh, be able to email you later. Um, but we're going to be talking about winter birds today. Um, it's, it's been a great year so far. You know, I, our, our director, Sarah Green, uh, we just had our staff meeting uh, yesterday, and she said she used the term flurry of birds uh, at, at a house that she was at this weekend, and uh, that's the same term that I use. I don't know if I stole it from her, she stole it from me, but, um, you know, it's, it, it happened to me two Mondays ago, and uh, I just went out. It was probably 7.45. I think I had just dropped the boys off to, uh, to school. I was just getting back to the house and uh, all of a sudden I just heard uh, uh, all this commotion and, and saw all this motion and um, grabbed my binoculars. I have some just hanging, hanging uh, from one of the shelves in the garage and um, grabbed those and, and saw all sorts of winter birds, dark-eyed juncos. Um, we had um, blue-headed vireos that we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, yellow-bellied sap suckers. And, and it was, you know, to me, it was kind of like me being inside of a, a snow globe and just all these birds were, were the snow. I mean, there was just so many of them, uh, probably 20 or 30 chipping sparrows. Uh, it was just really, really fun to, to be a part of. So, you know, I hope you get one of those flurries of uh, birds. They're, they're exciting and uh, boy, they can, they can add some joy to your day. Um, and, you know, you'll see those this time of year just because uh, there's a shortage of food with, with, uh, limited amount of leaves on the on the trees, you know, limited amount of, of food for them. So if you have a feeder out, um, they'll uh, kind of concentrate at it, right? Um, so we'll, we'll practice some sounds, you know, they're not singing right now, really, uh, the birds, um, but they are making some sounds here and there. And uh, um, we'll practice some of those and hopefully you'll you'll hear something one day and, and that'll put you on a bird that you've never seen before. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of their ID characteristics um, so you can figure out which bird you're looking at um, whenever you go out and uh, go birding or you're just uh, kind of enjoying the birds at your feeders. Uh, but real quick, you know, right here on, uh, on this one platform feeder, you know, platform feeders are, are like this green one down here. Um, you've got four birds. You've got some house finch, some brown streaky birds. I know uh, Rosemary had mentioned she's been seeing a lot of little brown birds and you know it looks like three little brown birds are right here right so which one's which but you have uh, these house finch right here you have the American goldfinch that aren't in their breeding plumage and you have this beautiful dark-eyed junco um, and then, then all of a sudden you have this big burst of color with the with the male northern cardinal so uh, you know I love love seeing these guys you know my, my parents have this uh, fig tree that's been there probably for 30 years in their yard and when it snows uh, gosh, we've seen a dozen, 15 or so uh, cardinals uh, sit on it and they just look like beautiful ornaments uh, against the white snow. So one, one of my favorite scenes. Um, but let's talk about feeders just real, really quickly. Um, these, are, these are the three that I like. Um, I don't really know what more you can, you can have out there, um, but you've got this hopper feeder um, and it keeps the food nice and dry. It's got this roof and you, you kind of lift that up and you pour your seed in there. I like using black oil sunflower seed. That's almost the, the, the only uh, food that I feed them in terms of seeds. Um, and then, you know, that'll go down, down as they eat it and then you just kind of refill it and it's, it usually stays nice and dry. So really great feeder and it does have these suet cages on the side and, and so does mine. And I really like that because you'll have all sorts of birds coming to this that love those seeds, but then you'll get things like pine warbler, maybe some yellow rump warbler, maybe if you're lucky, a, a yellow-throated warbler that's kind of overwintering here, uh, eating the suet. Um, you know, the nut hatches will come to it, woodpeckers will come to it. So you, you kind of increase the variety of birds at your feeder uh, by increasing the variety of, of food that you offer, right? Um, and then you have this platform feeder. Um, 
And, you know, you think about northern flickers uh, eating on the ground um, and other birds like dark-eyed juncos, pine siskin, you know, I've, a lot of those species will just kind of go into these feeders and just hunker down like they're feeding on uh, the ground. So I like having these. Um, I've, I've actually had a dove fall asleep and <laughs> sitting on a pile of food, sitting on a pile of uh, sunflower seeds. Um, so I like having both of these. And then you have this cylindrical one here that usually is for finches. Um, you do see a chickadee here, but goldfinch, and you have some other birds on there too. Um, and that is usually filled with niger seed, um, you know, or uh, thistle. Um, and that's just to attract those, those finches. Yes, ma'am. We had a couple of great questions about um, bird houses. So the first one, um, if you could talk about placement, where in the yard they should go, and also how to avoid um, having squirrels. Um, yeah get the bird seed. Okay, so I think I think it was bird feeders probably, right? Not bird houses. Okay, so bird feeders, um, you want to put them, you don't want them within around five or six feet of a tree. So you could have all the predator guards that you want, but if it is near a tree uh, or that close within five or six feet, you know, that squirrel's going to climb up the tree and then just jump right onto the feeder. Now there are feeders that once the weight of the squirrel get on it, it'll pull this lever down and, and they can't get to the food. So I guess they give up, but you know, there's always new ones that haven't seen it before that are gonna jump on it and you know, they're gonna spill seed. So, you know, I like to put mine, mine's probably around 50 feet from the house. Um, I have three feeders. Um, I don't want them to, to hit the windows in my house. Um, so you, you either put them right next to the window, uh, which I know doesn't make too much sense, but you either put them right next to the window so they don't have really the opportunity to, to gain that momentum and smack the window, um, or you put them, you know, uh, I would say tw at least 20 feet from the house, 15, 20 feet. Um, but again, mine are probably around 50 feet from the house, um, not near trees. Um, you do want a little bit of cover around those um, feeders just because uh, somebody had mentioned uh, in the chat box that they're seeing sharp shin hawks, they're seeing Cooper's hawks. Uh, you know, all sorts of birds of prey. So, you know, those little birds need a place to um, find cover in um, whenever those uh, birds of prey come hunting. So, you know, if you have um, a feeder near a bush, a thick bush, um, that's, that's a great place for them to, to find cover. I know in Columbia, uh, we had a, uh, an office space um, put out feeders and this one was just never getting used. Um, I mean, it was probably there for two weeks, uh, three weeks, four weeks, and the problem was there were there was no cover around it. Then they moved it, and there were some. Uh, I think there was some wax myrtle around it, which you know has leaves throughout the year. And uh, you know, probably within a week, they started having birds. So uh, just you know, put them by cover, not too close, um, and you can put them near trees, but not too close. Awesome. And then a question about suet. Um, they would like to know your favorite suet. Um, and then also, it looks like there's a question about if your suet gets mildew from rain, is it okay to scrape it off and still leave it for the birds? Yeah, I guess I would tr treat it like cheese that you would eat, right? Um, <laughs> or I would, I would eat at least. If it's moldy, I'll, I'll cut that off and, and eat the stuff that's inside. But um, yeah, I would cut it off. I don't think um, as long as, you know, you're not spreading the mold, you know, with the knife that you're using to, to cut it with. Um, I mean, usually suet is, is relatively inexpensive. I, I will buy any suet as long as it is American made. Um, I think we just have uh, I'm assuming we have better regulations on what we put into our food for birds. Um, so I only buy American made, but you can still buy it at, you know, Ace Hardware, um, you know, uh, any box store, um, Wild Birds Unlimited, and it's, and it's relatively inexpensive. You, you could find it for as little as 80 cents, um, I think, on sale, or you can get the really good stuff with like cashews and pistachios in it for, <laughs> for like five or six bucks. So depends on what your budget is, but, um, you know, I would go for whatever I could afford that's made in the United States. Um, but I would put it out. You, you really get a nice variety of birds. And we, we are only one slide in, and it is uh, 12 after right now. And I have 20 so slides, so Shannon is going to have to shock me or something um, just to let me uh, know or, or get going on this. <laughs> so let's go to the next one. Um, if you have any questions about feeders, you know, feel free to email us as well. Um, garden, common garden birds. Our, our friend Eric Sheely, who had a fantastic webinar, said, hey, let's stop calling our yards yards 
and uh, let's start calling our property gardens, right? Um, let's, uh, let's install a bunch of native plants. Let's make them gardens as opposed to just, you know, turf grass lawns or yards. Um, but you know, these are, these are pretty common birds that we see. Um, I think we saw uh, on the chat box before this started, you know, all of these right here, but you know, tufted titmouse, Carolina chickadee, uh, Carolina wren, bottom right. And then you have the beautiful female uh, Northern Cardinal, one of our prettiest uh, female birds. And I'm going to play these sounds and listen to, to the to the buzziness of the titmouse, and that can kind of be uh, confused with uh, you know the titmouse, the chickadee, and the and the wren. They kind of all sound similar, or can, uh, depending on which call they decide to use. But let's listen to this one real quick. You know, you had some high pitched squeaks, you had some kind of harsh, you know, wheezy sounds. And then let's listen to the chickadee. Notice how, how much quicker this one is than the, compared to the, the titmouse. But it does sound similar. Um, and this is just, you know, whenever you're, you're watching these birds, um, the, the only way to, to really uh, narrow down which one it is, is, is just by practicing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in the future, if, if you're not good at it, you'll, you'll be able to, you know, identify these birds by ear. But that Carolina chickadee is a little bit, um, well, it said chickadee, right? It, it did the classic chickadee sound, but it's a little bit quicker than the titmouse. Um, but they both make those high, high pitch um, sounds and with those wheezy sounds as well. So Northern Cardinal. I just wanted to play that because, you know, this time of year, you'll be um, a lot, if you have quite a few bushes in your yard, you'll probably have white throated sparrows. Um, you probably have yellow rumped warblers and all of those have, you know, a particular, um, you know, chipping sound that they make. Um, and the Northern Cardinal is pretty easy to, to determine, um, you know, when, when you, when you do hear those other ones uh, along with it, it has kind of a unique chip. Um, and, but again, it's, it's just, it, it comes to you with practice. So practice, 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 and you'll be able to, to determine which, which birds you have. And then finally, the Carolina Wren on this page. And they seem to always sing, right? So that was the tea kettle sound. You know, I use the, the word Germany a lot, Germany, 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 but that was a slower tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. And that's the one I would say, Germany, 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 Germany. So uh, just some sounds of some common birds and, and you'll hear those throughout the entire year. Um, I'm really excited this year uh, because I, we have all three nuthatch uh, probably throughout the entire state. Um, you know, sometimes in the, in the northern part of the stage or in the mountains, um, you know, we have some red-breasted nuthatch, but uh, typically where I am in the Midlands, I only have brown-headed nuthatch and then white-breasted nuthatch. But this is an eruption year, um, it seems like, because uh, we have quite a few red-breasted nuthatch down in South Carolina right now. Um, we also have a lot of pine siskin, um, and I've seen reports of evening grosbeak. Um, I think as far south as North Carolina, maybe Hendersonville. Um, and if y'all get an evening grosbeak, I am the first person you call, please. Um, that would be a lifer for me and that would be a gorgeous bird to, uh, to just watch. Um, but right now we have uh, all three of these nut hatches here in South Carolina. And I am going to play these sounds. Remember, you hear the sound, you'll know which bird you have out there. And if you haven't seen it, um, you can go find it. So let's play this one and see which one it is. So that sounds like a small bird, right? And this is the smallest of the three and it sounds like a squeaky toy, uh, but that's the brown headed nut hatch call. Isn't that neat? And so they need pine trees. So if you don't have pines, you're probably not gonna have that bird. Um, but if you have pines, uh, you, you probably do have it. Um, and let's listen to see and see which one this is. All right, it's larger, right? It seems a little bit louder. 
um, and it sounds a, l a little bit wonky. I'm going to go with Red Breasted Nuthatch on that one, and let's listen to this one. It's even a little bit deeper, okay? Um, and you think about the largest of these three, which is the White Breasted Nuthatch, um, it's, it's the call of the White Breasted Nuthatch. So deeper call. Um, and let's listen to this red breasted nut hatch one more time, because uh, I really want y'all to, w whenever you, you're going out uh, of, of the house or wherever you might be, I really want you to key in on this sound. Uh, so you can, can see this bird if you've never seen it before. I mean, it, it's a gorgeous little bird. Uh, look at the look at the contrasting black and white on that on that uh, face uh, and and the red on on the breast. I mean, just a really really pretty bird that we don't get every year. Uh, so so we had an eruption year I think three years ago of of pine siskin and, and red breasted nuthatch. So it's been a few years since since we've been able to see them. But I think the sound that they make is is as interesting as as the way they look. Isn't that weird? <laughs> and you may have multiple um, in, in your yard. You know, some, sometimes I'll, I'll go out and I'll hear one, one side and I have a few acres and then I'll hear another, you know, calling on the other side of the property. So, you know, they're, they're down in really good numbers and uh, just get outside and, and practice that sound and you'll, you'll be able to find one with your, with your binoculars. So a couple other winter birds that we have, and this was one that was in, involved in that, well, both of them were in that flurry of birds that I was talking about earlier. So a brown creeper and, uh, you know, these nuthatch um, feed by just kind of clinging onto the bark. They'll go on, you know, the limbs, but they always stick close to the bark. And this does the same. And you can see that its body is, is made for that. It'll kind of balance, you know, using its, its long tail here. Um, and it has that beautiful decurved beak, that beak that bends down and uh, it kind of uh, gets into those um, furrows and uh, crevices along the bark, finding, you know, maybe eggs, you know, insect eggs, uh, spiders, you know, other insects that are finding shelter in there. Uh, but this guy, he'll, he'll spiral down to the base of the tree and then, you know, uh, climb up. So once he's finished foraging on that tree, he usually will fly down to the next tree, um, low on that tree, and then he climbs back up. So they're kind of fun birds to watch. Um, but uh, if you haven't seen one, they're, they're pretty tough to see if you don't hear them first, uh, just because their camouflage is so great. But you look at that and, and it matches uh, the, the bark uh, really, really nicely. Uh, so tough to see, but, but easier to hear. Uh, it is high pitch, um, but uh, I think I read somewhere, it sounds like somebody it has metal, um, a steel chain and is just dropping it, if, if you can kind of imagine what that sounds like, but dropping it quickly. So see if you can hear what, I'm, what I just described it as. So it's subtle, all right? You might be thinking, hey, how am I supposed to hear that? It's subtle, um, but it can be heard. Um, and I, I guarantee if you can hear that pitch, um, You'll, you'll find that bird this winter because they seem to be, um, well, based on my experience, you know, so far this, this fall and winter, um, uh, pretty abundant this year, which is, uh, which is a good thing. And here's another high, high pitch sounding um, bird that we have here in the winter time uh, from about fall to uh, mid, mid spring. And that's a gorgeous, gorgeous cedar waxwing. And you see those in flocks and they make this uh, kind of whistling, whistling uh, sound. And, and I'm gonna play that right now. And you might say that sounded just like the brown creeper, um, but it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's airy, um, it doesn't have that trill to it. Um, and usually you just don't have one seed or waxwing. Every now and then you'll have one or two, but typically you find a flock of eight, you know, 12, 20, and that whistling or, you know, that airy whistle that they have is just kind of uh, saturating the, 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 the area that you're in. So, you know, it's not that subtle brown creeper, just um, high pitch. Uh, it is just kind of overwhelming that area where those cedar waxwing uh, are. So uh, I'm going to play, finish playing that out. It's a really, really high pitch. And I'm going to play this one one more time for you.
So if you have, if you have large trees, um, you have a good chance of, of having this. If you have a forested area, um, you have a good chance of having this brown, brown creeper. Um, and cedar waxwings will kind of just be all over the place. Uh, just, just pay attention where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in a city or out in the country, uh, you, you have these birds. So yellow and black birds at the feeder. Um, we're talking about goldfinch, unless y'all y'all get that evening grosbeak, uh, which would be, a, again, just, just an amazing treat to have. Um, we have the American goldfinch right here, and then we have the pine siskin. Remember, uh, the pine siskin aren't always here, uh, but it is a nice eruption year, and, and what that means is there's a, there's a shortage of food. So that brown, that I mean brown, uh, the red-breasted nuthatch that's here, and then the uh, pine siskin, that we have here have to come down a little bit further south than they typically would to, to find that food that they need to survive the winter. Um, so we have a nice, nice uh, uh, number of those here this year. And then, you know, we always have the uh, American goldfinch. They do uh, breed here as well, uh, but then they also in the summertime go up north to, uh, to breed. Um, but you'll find them pretty commonly at your at your feeders this type of time of year. So let's uh, let's listen to what the American goldfinch sounds like. So that's its flight call. That's the potato chip. It says potato chip, potato chip. I don't know if y'all can hear that, but I'll play it one more time. Potato chip chip. Isn't that neat? So, you know, if you've never seen one of these birds, and it happens, uh, I, let a, I let a walk uh, earlier this spring, just a, a small walk, and uh, a fellow was getting, he was probably in his early 30s, and he was getting so excited about American goldfinch, and he had never seen one before. And uh, I mean, they are some of the prettiest birds if you catch a male in its breeding plumage, um, I think, uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous birds. But one of the best ways to find those if you've never seen one is just listen to that potato chip call, potato chip and you'll see them. And they make all sorts of squeaks, um, you know, that, that you can learn as well. But that's, that's one of the easiest calls to, to remember, I think, because of the, the way to remember it. Um, but you notice it has no streaking at all. You know, this pine siskin, if you see a black and yellow bird at your feeder and you're like, oh man, is that the pine siskin or is that the American goldfinch? Well, you know, if it doesn't have any streaking, I'm gonna say it's probably the American goldfinch. But you see these nice black wings with these huge wing bars in them. Um, you know, uh, signifying that it's a, that's an American goldfinch. And then you have all this streaking. So if you um, are wondering if a bird at your feeder is a, is a sparrow or a finch or a siskin, well, if it has yellow um, and it's super streaked like this, it's, it's gonna be a pine siskin. They have a nice um, sharp, uh, you know, kind of a, a slender, I guess, conical bill. Um, but, you know, streaky and black and yellow, that's, uh, that's a pine siskin. My, my wife calls it a Steelers bird because some of them, you know, have a lot of uh, black, and, black and gold and she's from Pittsburgh. So she's a huge Steelers fan. She gets a little mean on Sundays if they're not doing too well. Um, and let's listen to their uh, weird call. So, you know, I've read, it sounds like a zipper going up. So, zzz, so see if y'all can hear that. Isn't that neat? And, and they'll make that sound now. They'll also, you know, they're, they're related to uh, the American goldfinch. Um, so they'll, sometimes they'll fake me out and I'll think it's American goldfinch when they do this, you know, weird whistle. Um, uh, but, you know, they, they can sound similar to a, to a goldfinch. Um, but, you know, this sound that I'm just playing right now is pretty unique to the pine siskin. So if you hear that and you'll hear it all the time, you know, I had, I think I counted 26 in my yard the other day and it was just, you know, those sounds going, going, going. And it kind of, again, is overwhelming, uh, similar to the, to the cedar waxwing. I'll have it again. There it is. So neat, neat sound that, that uh, we can hear in the winter time. So purple finch. I was wondering if I should like sing purple finch like purple rain, but I'm not brave enough to do that. But they're, they're gorgeous, gorgeous birds. And uh, Prince should have sung, uh, you know, sing a song about, uh, about this beautiful bird right here. But he didn't. He chose rain. I don't, I don't know what's up with that. Um, but we have purple finch and we have house finch. You know, the, the house finch were introduced to the east. They were brought over here and they've kind of over, overtaken the, the purple finch. I, I think I read somewhere that um, if given the chance, 95% of the times house finch will outcompete the purple finch. So these guys are kind of suffering out here in the east because 
of these house finch introduced from the from the west. Um, but you know, look at how similar those those are. Sometimes burden just isn't fair, right? But um, these are a little bit bigger. They can be around almost an inch longer um, than the house finch. So if you're if you see a red finch out there or reddish finch, and you're like, wow, that really looks large. You know, it has a good uh, good chance of it being a purple finch. But you know, look at this little patch right here that this house finch has. You know, uh, you you look at this beautiful male purple finch. Um, it doesn't have that. So, you know, most of them, you know, most of the house finch do have this little gap between this, this red and that red. Some of them can be, you know, redder than others. Um, I would say this one's kind of, you know, in the middle. Um, but none of them uh, that I've ever seen, you know, have this much color. There's, uh, there's an old naturalist, I think he's uh, well passed away by now, um, that described this, this bird as being dipped in, uh, I think, raspberry jam or raspberry juice or something, and, and you take it out and that's what you have. And I think that's a, <laughs> that's a really good description of that bird. But it just has this gorgeous, gorgeous uh, purplish hue to it. Um, and, and you see that the purple kind of continues down to the, to the back here, whereas the house finch, you know, really, really doesn't. Um, and look at these streaks that the house finch have. Um, this, this one is kind of purplish, um, and you know, these are just two pictures. I, I'm sure you're going to have some variation in, in the ones that you see. Um, and, and sometimes this guy can get, look like it'll have a, uh, have a crest on it every now and then. Um, but notice these lines right here, okay? Um, right here and right there, and they're, and they're still purple, you know? This, this one, uh, you know, doesn't really have the, the same type of pattern. I know it has the red line, and this one right here, but this is all purple, and then it's got the light purple and the light purple here. Uh, so, you know, once you get used to it, uh, they're, they're not too hard to, um, you know, figure out at the feeder. Now, the females can be a, a little tricky, you know, because they're brown and streaky, just like Rosemary said, little brown birds, what are they? Um, well, you know, again, this one has the female uh, purple finch has these, they almost look like a gross beak um, in the fall, like a, um, rose-breasted grosbeak, immature or female. They have these beautiful lines right here. And the house finch female just doesn't have that, or the immature just doesn't have that. So, um, and remember, this is gonna be, they can be around an inch larger. I, I think a, a hair under an inch larger than these house finch. So, you know, once you see these patterns and you get used to them, um, you know, you'll, you'll be able to determine which, which brown streaky bird you have at your house. Um, and keep those guides handy, you know, during the winter time, um, since birds can be a little tricky to identify. All right, and so we do have uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, sparrows here in the winter time. We have some sparrows in the in the summertime as well, in the breeding season, but we have even more during the the winter time. So one of the most common. Um, in the state is the white-throated uh, sparrow. And this is a really nice, um, probably a nice mature male right here. But look, I mean, white throat, you've got this beautiful yellow right here above and in front of the, the eye and this beautiful black and white. Um, this one's a little dirtier, isn't it? It's the same species, but it barely has yellow right here. So probably an immature, uh, maybe, a, maybe a female. Um, uh, you know, kind of a grayish, uh, creamy white throat, and then this tan uh, where this one has white. So same species, and this one has a little bit more streaking too. So again, probably an immature. Um, same species, but, uh, you know, kind of looks uh, different, doesn't it? Um, and they're large. Look, look, they can be 6.3 6 to 7.1 inches long. So uh, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty big in, in sparrow land. Um, and then you have this beautiful, which, uh, you know, I haven't seen here in, in the Midlands yet, but, but they come down, you know, from time to time, um, a white crowned sparrow. And you look at this bill that it has the beak. It, it can be orange, yellow, pinkish, um, whereas this one's usually going to be dark, okay? Um, so that's, that's one thing that you can use to, uh, you know, figure out which one you have. Uh, but the, the black and white are, it's a super contrasty bird. Um, so you have this, this great black and white here. Um, a lot of the, the gray goes around its neck where you have, you know, this streaking that kind of meets the black and white here. Um, some of them I've, I've seen, you know, it kind of gets close, but you have a little bit more gray back here on the, on the uh, white crown sparrow. Uh, typically, if you're in the upper state, you can you can get these. I know I have a friend in Newberry um, or 96, so Greenwood, um, that that has these almost every year. Uh, here in Chapin, I, I haven't been lucky enough to to catch one here, 
um, but I know they're around. Um, and then once you get to the coast or the the, the middle portion of the state, that you, you probably start to uh, get a reduction in how many white crown sparrows that you, you get there. But gorgeous, gorgeous bird. I want to play this song of the white-throated sparrow. It's, it, to me, uh, it, it's just one of the prettiest songs out there. And every now and then, it, even even though it's not breeding season, they'll they'll sing. And I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's a youngster that's just uh, that's just you know practicing for the next breeding season. Um, but you you hear them uh, vocalize a lot by by their chipping call, which I'm not going to do. But I, I do want to play this song. And again, sometimes you hear them. Uh, I go, I visit my parents on the south side of Lake Murray and their, their neighbor has a, a gorgeous, gorgeous yard and it's great habitat for, for sparrows. And uh, you know, sometimes in December, January, I'll, I'll hear them sing. So um, don't, don't count it out. You, uh, you'll, you'll hear them even in the wintertime sing. All right, I'm gonna torture y'all with some more sparrows because they are just tough, right? Um, they're here in the winter and it's a winter class, so I have to. Um, I wanted to put the size on here. You can see that these three are, are about as, you know, similar as they can get when, when we're talking about the size. Um, and the swamp sparrow, you know, you, you see this. I don't know if I would consider that streaking. Um, I mean, I, I guess you could, but it's really faded, isn't it? Um, you know, some of them have less than, than others. Uh, but this is a swamp sparrow. You see that around, you know, I see it around power lines, especially if they have uh, depressions in them that, that hold some water, uh, kind of wetter areas. Um, you know, thick areas, uh, you know, that's kind of the, what, what, what sparrows want. Um, a, a lot of them like those thick, thick areas. So think about uh, power lines, think about clear cuts. Um, but then you, ha you have some like the field sparrow and the savanna sparrow that will kind of, you know, get into places that are a little bit shorter and, and less messy, I guess. Uh, but the chipping sparrow we have year round. I think, you know, probably everybody here is, has seen it. Um, but, you know, around your feeder, if you haven't seen it, just, just, look, just look at it. Um, and it's usually, um, you know, feeding on the ground. It'll go up to the feeder uh, for sure. But you'll, you'll find a lot of these just kind of foraging on the ground where, where sparrows like to like to feed. And these guys eat a lot of, you know, plant material in the winter time, but uh, come breeding time, they, they eat a lot of insects. And that's why we're always kind of harping and, and, and focusing on uh, native plants and, and producing those insects in, in y'all's yards. Uh, but uh, you can see the difference uh, between the field sparrow and the chipping sparrow. Uh, you have, it, somebody said to me early on that it looks like someone airbrushed this field sparrow. And I thought, I, I never forgot that. And I think that's such a great um, description of it. And out of these three, if y'all care, or these three, uh, these five, this is my favorite. It is such a pretty, pretty sparrow. Um, it, it's, it's delicate looking. It has this beautiful eye ring, this white eye ring. It's kind of got this pinkish bill and pinkish legs and feet. Um, just a really, really uh, beautiful uh, bird. And, uh, you know, this one's a little bit more contrasting. You know, the, the, the colors are, are, are a bit bolder. You have this black line behind the eye, which the field sparrow does not have. Um, but uh, this, one, this one here, the swamp sparrow, a little bit more coloration on the, on the face than the chipping sparrow does. Um, and again, it's going to be, I've never seen one in my yard and I've been here for six years. You typically don't see them around feeders um, that I've, I've heard of. Uh, but when you go out to power lines and parks, um, they'll a lot of times be hanging out with uh, with song sparrows. Um, so let's get to the song sparrow, and you can see that this is a little bit bigger than these four right over here. Um, and you see the the streaking. So if you see this and you're like, okay, is that a swamp sparrow or a, or a song sparrow? You know, the swamp sparrow is not going to have this bold streaking, and typically you have this beautiful little dot you know, right here on its, on its chest, which this one looks like it's trying to do, right? Um, but if, it's, if it looks like it's trying to do it, it, it's probably not a swamp or song sparrow. You probably have something else there. But the streaking um, and, and the dot is, is pretty telltale of a, of a song sparrow. And again, a decent size um, sparrow. And you'll notice that this one has some streaking as well, but look how fine it is. Um, and that's a savanna sparrow. And it has, a lot of them you'll see this, 
uh, yellow marking right here in front of its eye and above its eye a little bit as well. Uh, not as bold as the white-throated sparrow um, and not nearly as, as large as the white-throated sparrow, but I find these a lot of times on the sides of roads, you know, if you're going through a, a, a farm, um, you, you know, out in the country uh, and a, a bunch of birds get up, a lot of times it'll, it'll be these savanna sparrows. But a gorgeous bird, um, you know, kind of kind of delicately um, uh, patterned um, compared to this one. You know, one uh, a fellow once told me uh, there's another bird called a Lincoln sparrow um, that looks a lot like a song sparrow, but it has a little bit of buffiness, so kind of brownish right here, brownish, you know, there. It looks like it was dunked in chocolate milk and then just patted dry. Um, but it but it almost looks identical to a song sparrow, but he said the song sparrow looks like a, a kid grabbed a, a crayon and drew, you know, marked all these streaks. Whereas on the Lincoln sparrow, it looks like, you know, an artist, an artist, I don't know why I said it like that, an artist, um, an artist uh, took a pencil and, and put those marks on the Lincoln sparrow. Um, so I just, I, I never forgot that. And I just think that's a great way to dis uh, describe these, these birds and, um, and kind of kind of get you to remember the difference, but uh, the Savannah Sparrow looks like you know that same artist uh, grabbed that uh, pencil and um, made those marks. So just little ways to remember which sparrow you have. But again, it's studying, 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 um, and that'll that'll make you a better wintertime birder. All right, let's get to these rock stars, uh, little and spunky. Uh, it's kind of like my wife, uh, but she doesn't have a yellow or a ruby. Uh, mohawk on her. Um, but yeah, so golden crown kinglet, um, you know, if, if you ever get up to the mountains um, during the summertime, every now and then you'll, you'll see some uh, breeding up there, which is, which is pretty neat. Now these ruby crown kinglets, they go way, way north to, uh, to breed during the summertime. Um, but they're here, they're both here right now in South Carolina. And boy, when you see one of these, I mean, it just blows your mind, uh, especially if they have that crown flash like that. But the first time I ever saw one, um, I was studying their sounds, okay? So studying, studying, studying their sounds. Um, you know, it was probably about seven or eight years ago and I was in South Carolina. I was actually deer hunting with my uh, brother and my father and uh, we didn't get anything, we're bad hunters. And we were driving in the car, I was driving, and I had the windows down so I could hear for this golden crown kinglet because I wanted to see it so badly. So we were on a dirt road and uh, all of a sudden I heard this high pitch whistle, kind of similar to a, uh, a cedar wax wing, but different. Um, and I slammed on the brakes. My brother said, what the heck are you doing? I said, golden crown kinglet. And so I got out and there was this small persimmon tree that was on the edge of a clear cut next to the road, next to the dirt road. And there were probably about 10 of these golden crown kinglets. I have no idea why they were so agitated, um, but they all had their mo mohawks up. They all had their crowns up. And I remember my, my dad and my brother who are not birders, um, we just sat, we just kind of leaned against the car and just watched them. And I just remember my brother going, whoa. <laughs> so uh, that was a, that's the moment I'll never forget uh, just because it's kind of funny. And I just remember, I've never, even to this day, I've never seen so many at the same time with their, with their uh, crowns up like that. So golden crown kinglet, uh, really, really fast forger. So it bounces around a lot. Um, so is the ruby crown kinglet. Um, and I am going to play their sounds so y'all can find these birds this winter. And I know some of y'all are thinking, hey, that sounds just like the brown creeper, and it sounds very similar. Um, but a lot of times what I typically hear, I'm, I'm talking about over six, seven, eight years, is a, is a quick three note uh, um, a, a lot of times. And then the brown creeper will just kind of, um, you know, drop that chain and, and make that quick high pitch uh, trill. So um, similar, no doubt about it. Um, but typically I, I hear this when, when I think about these golden crown kinglets. So high pitch. And the, the ruby crown kinglet doesn't sound anything like that. And I would imagine some people can get that confused. I think I have with a uh, Carolina wren. Um, you know, they can make uh, a similar sound, but um, let's listen to it again. So, you know, if, if you have 
Well, you know what? I've, I've seen both of them foraging around clear cuts. Um, so if you have a weedy area around your house, but if you have trees, you know, around your house, you, you should have both of these. Um, maybe not every day, but you should have them at, at some point this, this winter. So study those sounds and, and go find those birds. So uh, let's just talk about woodpeckers for a little bit. Um, you know, uh, these all, three out of the four are here year round, but you know, this yellow belly sapsucker comes here during the, during the winter time. But let's start off with our smallest woodpecker, the downy woodpecker. And I just had one uh, disappear into my bluebird box uh, uh, two or three weeks ago. It was really neat. It was in the evening and uh, I'm assuming he just went in there for, for the night. So that was really neat uh, for me to see. And we have the Northern Flicker. And that, and that was probably a juvenile barred owl that just, just did that to, I, I didn't want to confuse anybody there. So that, that keer sound, that keer, uh, northern flicker, and then it'll do something, well, it's called flicker because of uh, a sound that it makes flick, flick, flick. So it'll do that in a second. But come on, the, uh, I mean, birds really don't get much prettier than this right here. Isn't that crazy that we have this in S South Carolina? Um, you know, it seems like you, you, you would think that you'd have to go to Costa Rica or Central America, you know, South America to see something this pretty, but <laughs> that is in our backyard right now. And I think that's pretty darn cool. Um, and you have the yellow belly sapsucker. It sounds like a cat that ate too much catnip. So that's a nice male. It's got the red on the throat. A, a yellow wash, you know, it's kind of poorly named. Uh, so a, a yellow wash right here. And it has these um, uh, bars on the side of them too. You can't see it on this one. And you can, you can tell once you practice, uh, you know, a, a yellow belly sap, sap sucker from a, from a long way uh, away. But uh, this is a great photo that, that a friend of ours, Zach Steinhauser took. I think it's really nice. Um, but let's play that one more time since I was talking a little bit. You know, I guess you could maybe get it confused with one of the uh, nut hatch, um, but but after a little bit of practicing, you'll you'll know that that uh, funky sound that it makes is a is a sap sucker. And uh, let's do the pileated or pileated. And I'm pretty sure you're not going to get that confused with anything else. You're not going to think that that's a chickadee. <laughs> it's a it's a large bird and it makes a large sound. Mm -hmm. Dennis wants to know if the yellow-bellied sapsucker is also called a yellow hammer. You know what? Um, I'm sure, I'm sure somebody's know. called it that before. I think I've heard that, and I don't know if somebody was talking about the, the northern flicker, um, but, uh, you know, they, they could have been talking about the yellow-bellied sapsucker. I haven't heard it on, on one of my walks or, or during any walk, um, but, you know, it does have that yellow wash, but, you know, this northern flicker, it's a, it's a yellow-shafted, uh, northern flicker out west they have a red shafted um, but it has a lot of yellow right here and when it flies away it has a, a ton of yellow under its wings and you know from what I've read it, it kind of uh, what what scientists think is you know so if, if there's a cooper's hawk or a, or a sharp shin hawk that's going after this flicker and it starts flying all of a sudden it sees this burst of yellow and it, it's supposed to what they think uh, confuse the predatory birds that might be after this flicker so Maybe they, they would call that the yellow hammer um, as opposed to this one, just because it has more, but possibly the, the sap sucker too. A quick Google search did confirm the northern flicker is the yellow <laughs> All right. hammer. Same page, Dennis, yes, just different nice birds. Job, Dennis. Thanks. All right, so red-headed woodpecker versus red-bellied woodpecker. You know, whenever I, I talk to friends about birds and you know, they might not be birders, but they have their uh, feeders up. They always say, oh, I've got this red-headed woodpecker. And it's like, I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. And I've had feeders up for, you know, seven years or so, eight years now. And I don't think I've ever had a red-headed woodpecker at my feeder. I do know that people get them, but uh, they're probably talking about this. It does have a red head, right? Or red on its head, but they're probably talking about the red-bellied woodpecker, which again, uh, you know, not, not uh, accurately named, but it does have a red wash, some more than others. Um, but it does have a nice, nice red on its head. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Um, you know, uh, it, which just reminds me, we were, we were going out uh, of the driveway one day and I have this great post oak next to the, next to the driveway. And, 
and my wife saw a bird, you know, just kind of perched on the, the, the bark like this, you know, right, like this red-headed woodpecker. And my son saw it too, and they were both like, wow, that bird is so beautiful. And I've been trying to tell them for five or six years that the red-bellied woodpecker is a gorgeous, gorgeous bird. But <laughs> it wasn't until that point that they actually, you know, saw it up close, I guess, and, and realized how pretty it was. Um, but, uh, you know, most people are probably talking about the red-bellied woodpecker. Again, you know, some people, especially around Lake Murray, do get the red-headed woodpeckers at their feeders. And y'all, you know, probably, you know, get, get them too. But uh, I would say more often than not, it's, it's probably the red the red belly. Um, but, uh, you know, this has uh, great big white and black patches. No other uh, woodpecker that we have in South Carolina has that. So if you see, you know, a, a medium-sized woodpecker that's flying, usually in a straight line, uh, you know, woodpeckers tend to undulate, they up and down when they fly. Um, out of all seven or eight that we have here in, in the wintertime, that one probably has the, the straightest flight. Um, but if you see a straight flighted woodpecker that, that has white and black patches, it, it's probably a redhead. And obviously, if it has that red, red hood and that red head, uh, you, you know exactly what you have. But they make a, they, uh, you know, they're beautiful birds, but their sound that they make is, is pretty harsh. We'll listen to that now. And then let's compare that to the red-bellied woodpecker. It, bounce, it bounces a little bit more. You know, the sound bounces a little bit more. It's, it's not as metallic-y, it's not as harsh. And then it has that cough that <coughs> um, y'all have probably always, or y'all have probably heard of Drew Lanham, um, the brilliant fella up in, uh, Clemson, um, ornithologist, uh, poet, athlete, everything. Um, he described that, you know, five or six years ago as, as a cough and that, that stuck with me. Uh, and we'll play that again. And I, and I, and I can't remember, I, I can't think of another bird that does that. And I don't know if y'all noticed that, but there was a gold, goldfinch that was kind of bouncing around doing the potato chip song and or that call and, and, and during that, during that red belly woodpeckers call. All right, so we'll get to the yellow rumped warbler. Uh, a funny name some people call that bird is a, is a butter butt because it looks like somebody took a slab of butter and just popped it right on its, on its rear. Uh, but that's a common bird. I, I have this great wax myrtle um, that it just had thousands and thousands of seeds on it this year. It's pretty big uh, in the front yard. And the, the yellow rumped warblers probably cleaned off the, the, every single seed in about three days. I was kind of bummed out, but I was happy that I provided food. But um, I was kind of bummed out that I didn't have any more food for, for anything else. But, you know, you think about most of the warblers that head down to, I think we have around 57 of them that come to North America to breed. Um, most of them leave. They go down to Central America, the Caribbean, uh, South America. Um, but most of them can't eat seeds. Well, this yellow rump warbler can, the yellow-throated warbler can, the pine, war uh, pine warbler can. And so they don't have to fly as far south, which I think is a pretty cool adaptation. Uh, so yellow rump warbler, and I'm going to play its chip call. And you're probably thinking it sounds just like the, the Cardinals, um, and it's similar. But, um, you know, again, getting, getting field experience and going out there um, will, will help you figure out which one you're, you're listening to. And then the yellow-throated warbler, um, I know they're, they're around the Midlands every now and then. Once you start going down to the coast, uh, you Charleston folks um, and, and other coastal folks, y'all y'all can uh, get these uh, during the wintertime, which, uh, which is pretty darn cool. A gorgeous bird to, to have consistently at your feeder. Gorgeous, gorgeous bird. And then a blue-headed vireo. Um, there were two in that flurry that I was talking about a couple Mondays ago. In, in my yard. There were two that were feeding in the oak trees together. And I, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, but I think one of the prettiest birds that we have in the wintertime, this, this picture doesn't really do it justice. And once the sun shines on it, it glows even more, but has this steely blue head, you know, this yellow wash here, yellowish up here, these beautiful wing bars, and then these cool, spe what they call spectacles, you know? Um, so really, really cool bird. And here's, the, here's one of the sounds that it'll make even in the, even in the wintertime, so you can find this bird. So those vireos can, can really make some crazy sounds as, as we know during the, during the spring and summertime.
So uh, those are probably some of the more colorful birds that you'll see in the winter. Um, so uh, small birds, uh, dark, dark eyed junco. Um, I saw my first one in the snow when we lived in Pittsburgh and I called a, called a, a family member of mine and who was into birds and, and he knew right away what it was, but gorgeous bird to see on snow, just like the, just, just like the Cardinal. Um, but let's listen to its call or its song. All right, and let's compare it to the Pine Warbler song. And study these, and, and Merlin Bird ID, uh, which a lot of these, uh, well, I think almost all of the sounds come from, and the picture, a lot of the pictures come from, um, uh, Merlin Bird ID is a great app to have to, to practice these sounds, but, you know, the, the Pine Warbler is a little bit more melodic, you know, it's a, it's a, it seems like it had more training, uh, sing, singing training than the uh, Dark Eyed Junko here. Uh, this is a little bit more metallic-y, where this is a little bit uh, more melodic. But uh, obviously, physically, you can't um, probably confuse these. Um, but uh, you know, I could see maybe in the in the springtime, once once both of them are singing a lot, you know, you could probably confuse the the songs. And you'll see both of these at your feeder. I had mentioned um, uh, suet, but these guys will the pine warblers. Um, they're here year round. Um, it, they'll come to the seed. They'll come to the suet um, and, you know, uh, they migrate down. So we have a lot that come here uh, and join our year round birds. So sometimes you can see seven, eight, nine, ten 10 at your, at your feeders. And it's a really, really neat thing to see when there's cardinals, you know, you've got maybe purple finch. Uh, so you've got red, you've got uh, maybe a blue bird there, blue, yellow, and, and it can really add a nice uh, burst of color to your, to your feeders. Um, and this, this one typically um, will feed on the ground. So if you spill some seed or if you just toss them out there, uh, some, a lot of times you'll have those dark eyed juncos. And so we have a few owls here in South Carolina. Um, these are year round. Uh, and maybe since the um, red breasted nuthatch and the uh, pine siskin are here, maybe, that'll, uh, maybe that means that we'll, we'll be visited by a snowy owl, which isn't a resident. Um, but every now and then we'll, we'll get those down here. Um, let's see if you can hear Who's Asleep, Me Too. So Who's Asleep, Me Too of the Great Horned Owl. So Who's Asleep, Me Too. I love these mnemonics. Uh, they just help me remember so many of these sounds um, for, for birds. I'm going to play that one more time. So Who's Asleep, Me Too. Um, yes, ma'am. Just a friendly reminder that we, it's about five till and you've got a number of slides oh, to get through. We'll burn through them, thanks. She gave me a warning in, instead of shocking me. So here's a, a cranky Eastern screech owl. Doesn't he, doesn't he look cranky though? So Zach Steinhauser took that one, but that was uh, in what, that was uh, the male probably uh, from our box in our, in our woods. So the female is typically in the, in the box, you know, feeding the babies and the male is usually out hunting and he feeds, uh, feeds everybody uh, or gets the food for everybody. So this is the sound for the screech owl. So it doesn't really sound owl-like. And then the barred owl who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all. See if you can hear that. So who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all? And uh, these, these two pictures are from Vance Stolseth, another talented photographer right here. So an Eastern towhee, and it's called a towhee because of this sound right here. Towhee. So you typically don't hear it sing its drink your tea song right now, but you do hear it say towhee a lot. And there was a there was a prairie warbler that was calling in the background. So that was during breeding season. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, this is a question not from the chat box, but for me. So why why would we not hear the drink your tea song right now? Well, because that's the it's breeding song. Um, so if I'm a male and I'm trying to attract a female, I'm gonna I'm gonna really belt out a nice drink your tea so I can attract that nice health, healthy female to start a family with. So typically we don't hear the songs right now. We we hear that that quick toe sound great good question all right so you know this bird is in decline it's a it's a it's a large sparrow is what it is 
Um, and it's in decline and, and we'll talk about um, why in a little bit, but you think about all the development that's going on and, and you know, what, what did this, uh, what was this in the past? You know, was it a forest? Was it a field that had, you know, uh, habitat, those edges that the, the towhee likes, those thick tangles? Um, but too many uh, houses are, are like this now, you know, too many yards. They're, they're not the gardens that Eric likes to talk about. They're, uh, they're yards. But once you start doing something like this, and, and y'all have probably seen this, this is probably one of my favorite slides that I use in my presentations. Once you do this, you're going to have towies. I can almost guarantee you. Uh, take out the camellias, take out the nandina, take out the roses that shouldn't be there, and put in some Joe Pye weed, put in some um, black eyed Susan, uh, some purple cone flowers, uh, create some thick areas for the brown thrasher, for the gray catbird, for the eastern towhee and other sparrows during the winter time. Um, and you're going to have a lot of these birds and you're going to support and uh, cause the, the population of these birds to increase because most of the birds that I talked about today are in decline, some of them pretty significantly. And I'm talking about 70, uh, 60, 70 uh, percent uh, decline for a lot of these bird species um, that, that I've talked about. Um, so, you know, think about less yard and more garden. And, uh, you know, I'm not uh, a purist, I do sprinkle in some some foreign plants here and there, uh, but I do want to keep around 70-75% of my plants um, uh, native, uh, and I never want to plant something that is invasive. So uh, other things to think about during the fall time, uh, add a brush pile. You know, I've, I've seen a big flock of around 30 dark-eyed junk, juncos seeking uh, cover around a, a, one of my brush piles. Uh, you know, deer uh, seek cover around it as well. I've got about, I think, five or six brush piles on my three acres, and uh, they're, they're really great places to explore. So if your property can uh, handle a brush pile, pop one on there. They're fantastic places for, for not only um, uh, birds, but for other, other wildlife too. Uh, water, um, you know, in the summertime, water, you know, is kind of hard to come by, uh, but sometimes it doesn't rain in the in the wintertime for a week or two. So think about putting out the water, just watch out whenever it, it freezes, you, you're going to want to um, dump out that water so it doesn't um, freeze and then crack your uh, cement. Um, evergreens, uh, seed producing shrubs and trees, you know, we were talking about the wax myrtle earlier, uh, sea myrtle, you know, can be great. Um, Eastern red cedar, uh, um, let's see, hollies, you know, they're, they're all great uh, plants to install on your property if you don't have them yet. Uh, prepare your yard for next year's breeding season uh, by planting native trees and, and shrubs and, and perennials. Uh, so it's a good time to plant shrubs and native trees. Uh, you might want to wait until the, the spring to plant the perennials, but, um, you know, increase the, the insects on your property by planting native. And leave an area of your property untouched. Um, let's see. Oh, okay, yeah, so native shrubs, annuals, uh, perennials will fill in where that turf grass was to create an area beneficial for pollinators, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Uh, it's it's the, the, the left side of my house looking from the road is exactly this. And now we have, you know, probably five or six different perennials there uh, flowering um, and probably three different types of grasses that have overtaken it. And we've seen gross beak in there, we've seen bunting in there, we've seen sparrows in the wintertime. So if you have a large enough property um, to do that in, please, please do it. You'll, uh, as a birder or a bird lover, lover, you'll be happy you did. And so finally, help us advocate, um, help us conserve and help us educate. Um, and an example of our advocacy is is us supporting um, this, this, this policy, this law that, that was passed. And you know, the, the governor has a big smile on his face touching a turtle. Um, and that law is now protecting our amphibians and turtles. And uh, it, just, uh, it just passed, I think this past fall. So great, great um, uh, thing that we, we supported there. Um, help us with our conservation efforts. Uh, in a couple of years, uh, in two years only, we've put up 290 boxes for the prothonotary warbler. And look, again, just like the governor, everybody's got smiles on their faces. You know, look, Alex back there has a smile on her face. So this is DNR and I uh, putting up, installing a bunch of uh, prothonotary warbler boxes. And all these kids have smile on their faces too, learning about snakes with our snake expert, Brandon Ergel. But help us educate as well. Um, uh, and since COVID is, is a thing right now, we're not getting into, you know, we're not physically uh, able to visit schools, but, 
you know, over the last two weeks, I think I've reached around 220 ish, 250 students, and I'm scheduling more and more, teaching them about snakes, teaching them about uh, birds, teaching them about conservation, you know, not littering, uh, what littering does to, to our wildlife. And uh, we have a ton of webinars, over 20 so far, um, that I want y'all to check out. Um, so support us. We can't do it without y'all's support. So please visit the website. If you want to follow us on uh, Facebook or Instagram, there, there are the handles right there. Um, but again, can't do it without y'all. And just to get y'all excited for springtime, ah, there's some color right there. More color than we, we typically see right now. Uh, so uh, that's it. I just wanted to leave you with that one. And that's the bird right there that changed my life. We did have a couple questions throughout the webinar that were more about um, better birding tips, which I would of course recommend everybody go watch your better birding webinar. Um, but what is your favorite book for learning how to ID birds? You know, I don't really have a favorite book. Um, my sister got a book probably nine years ago, right when I first started, um, you know, but uh, I can't even remember which one it is off the top of my head, but Peterson, Sibley's, you know, it's not one of those, but, um, you know, are, are very, very well known. Um, I like to learn by going online, uh, allaboutbirds.org, which again, a, a lot of these pictures come from that website and a lot of the sounds. Their app, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's app is uh, Merlin Bird ID. So, I love going on that app. Um, I love going on allaboutbirds.org. Um, Birds of North America, I think it changed its website, but um, I think it's called like Birds Around the World Now, is a, is a great one. You have to pay, I think, 50 bucks for a year, but it's well worth it if you want to learn more about birds. But I like to go online. Uh, there's just way more information, uh, way more pictures than you'll ever find in a field guide, in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, and your webinar, Becoming a Better Birder, does a great job really diving into those resources. Um, you might want to flip back to a slide that's more featuring our winter birds, but before you do, uh, we did have a question about what that bird was in the top right. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a bobolink. Um, you know, and, that, and that's a bird that, that's in pretty steep decline, but they called that the, the rice bird back in the day because it would come to the plantations and, and engorge on the, uh, uh, the rice. Um, but that bird flies all the way down to South America, has a really long uh, migratory, uh, um, I guess, pattern in the, in the winter and the, uh, or the fall and the springtime. But yeah, Baba Link right here. And that's the prothonotary warbler, sorry. And that's the scarlet tanager, painted bunting, uh, Baltimore Oriole, and the chestnut sided warbler. Very nice. Um, we had a lot of education happening in the chat box. We learned um, other names for thistle seed and the correct spelling. Um, and Greg wanted to know if um, that thistle seed is great for um, attracting birds like goldfinches and pine siskins. Yeah. Um, is that a seed you're familiar with or would you still just recommend um, that oiled sunflower seed. Yeah, so the black oil sunflower seed. Um, that's typically the, the only one I use. If I was um, wanting to attract goldfinch um, or pine siskin, um, I would probably, and I, I was just a diehard fan of theirs, I would probably put out niger seed or the thistle. Um, and most of that, from what I understand, it's, it's uh, uh, sterilized. So you're not going to be planting you know, all these uh, plants that shouldn't be here. So it's, it's, it's not a problem from uh, anybody that I've ever heard that uses that, including myself. Um, you know, well, a couple winters I've used the niger seed and the thistle seed and, and, and my yard doesn't, has never had, you know, one of those plants. And to that note, Greg, Greg also asked um, if fresh fruit attracts birds this time of year. Uh, you, you know, if you, if you have an Oriole, if you're on the coast, I think it might be worth putting up a upside down orange, you know, cut it in half and, and, and put them up flesh, flesh side up. Um, and you might get a, a, an Oriole, you know, coming uh, to it. Um, you know, dried fruit is typically pretty expensive. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if, uh, if they come to that during the, during the winter time, but you can always experiment. Um, you know, I just stick to the black oil, sunflower seed, um, niger seed, thistle on occasion, and then that suet. But if I did have Orioles, I would probably be putting out um, uh, oranges. That's it for questions right now. 
if anybody else has one, we'll give you one more minute to type it in. Otherwise, um, you can follow up with Jay directly via email and we will put his email in our recap with the recording. No questions? Okay, what's your favorite winter bird? Uh, you know what? It's got to be the blue-headed vireo. I just absolutely, that, that bird makes funky sounds. Uh, it's gorgeous. I don't see it all the time, uh, so it keeps me wanting more. Uh, so, you know, that, that's got to be it. But, you know, these guys right here, you, you can't beat this. I don't know. I like them all, y'all. Uh, <laughs> but those are two of uh, a couple of my favorites. Awesome. All right. Well, that's it for questions. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining, and we will see you um, in 2021 with new webinars. All right, guys. Thank you so much for attending. Appreciate the support.